Chrissy, thank you so much for joining us on the Remodeling Podcast. I'm so honored to be here, Emily. Thank you for having me. Um, For anyone who does not know you, I know all about you. I've followed you for a really long time. But for anyone who's listening is unfamiliar, can you give us a little bit of a snapshot of who you are and a little bit about you and your background? Yes. So I'm Chrissy Rutherford. I feel like most people know me because I was an editor at Harper's Bazaar for many, many years. Um, I was there for almost nine years. I left in 2020. And while I was there, I worked um, on the website and I was a fashion editor. So I did everything from like writing fashion news stories to styling shoots, to covering events, traveling all over with brands, attending fashion week, doing all that really fun stuff. Um, And yeah, I transitioned out like right as the pandemic was kind of starting, which was not planned, but, um, and now I'm a content creator full time. I also do DEI consulting with my business partner, Danielle Prescott. I also have a newsletter that I launched in 2021, right on the cusp of the newsletter boom called forward joy. And uh, I've also been hosting a podcast for Maybelline about mental health. That's amazing. That's quite a bio. Um, So much that I want to talk about in there, because with this entire podcast, what I find so interesting about people and their stories is like how they got from point A to point P and all of those decisions and transitions in between. So I want to take it back to Harper's Bazaar just for a moment. How did your formal kind of corporate career begin? Did you know you always wanted to be in kind of that fashion beauty world or did you stumble upon it? How did it all come to be? So because I knew exactly what I wanted to do, I went to a liberal arts school where I majored in communication with a focus in media studies. So I also got to kind of tailor my major um, to fashion and like fashion marketing and advertising and all that. So that made it a bit more fun. And then my last two years in college, I interned at Harper's Bazaar print in the fashion closet my last two summers. And that was like, you know, going into the belly of the beast. And like, of course, when you love magazines, you don't think about all the work that actually goes into how these things are made. But even though it was such a hard internship, I loved every second of it and just felt really energized by it. So I was like, this is definitely where I'm meant to be. So then, of course, I come out of college, 2008, the economy is crashing. And I felt very confident because I had such a great rapport with the editors I worked with. I came out of school being like, oh, I'm going to get a job so easily. Like, I'm taking the summer off. I don't have to worry about this. Like, (laughs) it's in the bag. And then suddenly, everyone was getting laid off of magazines. So... It took me like another sort of like year and a half before I really found my footing. I did just like any sort of freelance jobs I could find in the fashion industry. And I was very fortunate because I grew up in Westchester County, just an hour outside the city. I could live at home, commute into the city as need be for interviews. And then, yeah, my first my first gig was actually working at InStyle.com. And I got that job because the fashion director there used to be an editor at Harper's Bazaar when I was an intern there. And it's so interesting to see those little connections because then I worked there for a year and one of the editors I worked with there went to take over bizarre.com. And then eventually when she could hire someone, she brought me over there. So Ah. I've been really fortunate in that respect. And as you know, it's like our industry is all about relationships. So uh, I felt very thankful that I worked with people who saw how passionate I was and really wanted to help nurture that within me and wanted me along for the ride. I love hearing that story. I feel like we're a similar age. So I was kind of the same way. Like I adored fashion and I was just so excited and enthralled to just be like a part of the conversation. But I feel like for me, people are always like, oh my God, a model, like the glamour, all of those things. Did you feel like when you entered the industry, were you like, wait a minute, like I got the wrong, (laughs) this isn't what I envisioned or were you like, I'm in it. Like, this is exactly what I thought it was going to be like? I think it was definitely a bit different, but I never felt disappointed by the lack of glamour of it all. I think because I just knew that it was where I wanted to be. And I, and I also understood like, it's a business at the end of the day. 
people are trying to make money. Like that is first and foremost. And I also think when you feel really passionate about something, like you can still feel that like wonder around the really mundane parts of it. Like, yes, Mm -hmm. of course, there's definitely, you know, glamorous moments. Like I will never forget the first time I got to assist on a photo shoot when I was an intern at Bazaar. Lily Donaldson was the model and oh my God, it was so incredible. I was just like in awe the whole time. Meanwhile, like schlepping bags and steaming clothes and running around the studio and doing all these things. And it's a lot of work, but like you still just feel so lucky to be there. Yeah. You're making me like so nostalgic (laughs) because you're like, you sound like a true like fashion girl and like love that time and era, same era as me. Yeah. And I I miss those days. I know. And the industry (laughs) is not like that anymore. That sparks my next question for you, because you go from kind of like being so heavily in the mix and in the fashion world, and then you spin off and go off to do your own thing and become a content creator. That is like your trajectory, right? So what made you go like, all right, I'm going to kind of do this on my own? You know, I think after spending so much time at Bizarre.com and like, listen, I came in at such an incredible time where the website was still sort of like a dumping ground for the magazine. There wasn't a lot of original content and it really felt like the sky was the limit, Um, especially I feel like around like 2014, 15, Mm -hmm. 16. And when we started getting a little bit more budget because people cared about digital and we got to do all, you know, our own original photography and, and you just get to wear so many different hats. I was running the Instagram account, but like after a while working at that pace for so many years, you are just bound to get burnt out. And I think, you know, about maybe like three years before I left, there was just like this little voice inside of me that was like, even though I love this job, I think there's something more for me to do. Like there's something different. There's, this isn't going to be my forever job. And I think also this is something really helpful to keep in mind for anyone who's listening, who works in a corporate space or, you know, works in a more traditional structure. Like if you look at your boss, like, do you think, oh, I want that job someday? I didn't want that. I didn't want her job because her job, once you get to that level, your job's actually not creative anymore. It's so just like you're managing budgets and you're just so removed from like the real magic of it. And I am a true creative. Like I loved brainstorming shoots and sitting in a room with my really brilliant team and watching how like someone could throw the most random idea out there. And then we would turn it into like a viral concept. It was really, I was just there at a really incredible times. So, but yeah, at the same time I felt, I started feeling really burnt out and I just felt like there's, there's more for me out there. And it was an incredibly difficult decision to make, to walk away from something that felt like my dream job. That job meant everything to me. And I wouldn't be where I am today without it. So I have like immense amounts of gratitude for that time. Um, Even though I kind of walked away with a bit of like a sour taste in my mouth. But I think that's also, that's, that just happens a lot of times in these really intense creative industries. So I don't think my story is even unique. You know, I think a lot of people feel that way. Yeah, I'm sure they do. I just find it interesting. The gravity of that decision to me would feel so like scary. And I feel like in this podcast, that's what I find so interesting is hearing like, where was these moments where you were like, I need change or I need to like create this change or like make this massive decision. So when you decided to go off on your own and start creating content and start consulting, and now you have the podcast with Maybelline, were there any growing pains in that initial jump though? Like, were there moments where you were like, oh, whoops, like, I don't know what I'm doing. Or did you kind of have the experience from Harper's and fashion that you were like, I know how this, I know how this works. Yeah, I, I knew, I knew like the lay of the land. I 
you know, before I left Bizarre, I had already started creating content on the side for brands. And that was also a point of contention, of course, yes. at my job and part of the reason yeah. why I left because I, you know, I wasn't getting paid a ton and I definitely wasn't getting paid what I felt I was worth for what I was contributing. So, you know, the last like three, four years that I was there, I was like, okay, you know, there's, there's something here. Like brands are coming to me. They want to partner with me. Um, and so I did a little bit of it on the side as much as I could without like getting completely in trouble. And I saved all of that money because there's no way also I would have been able to leave my job if I did not have like some real savings under yeah. me. So I saved about like $50,000 and I knew that, okay, because I'd already worked with a few brands, I knew that mm -hmm. there was a path there. But, uh, you know, again, like I came out of that job February, 2020. So mm -hmm. I didn't know what was coming for us. So again, I was like, thank God I had that savings. And, you know, we went into lockdown six weeks after I left my, my very stable job to just like be sitting inside of my apartment doing nothing. I mean, no one could have predicted such a time, but I can't imagine what it felt like. It was, it was wild, but there was also a part of me that felt really relieved because I needed that downtime. I kind of had like a solid four months of not really working because even with brand partnerships, like all the brands really like pulled the brakes on everything at the very beginning. And then they had to shift and realize, okay, there's no way out of this. It's like, you just have to pay people to create content at home. And so things exactly. like really started to pick up again by like May, June. Um, and then, you know, my life really changed because I posted a video that went viral um, the very end of May. It was a after the murder of George Floyd. And I made a video talking about why I felt it was really important for people to speak up about racism, like regardless of how many followers you have, because I think a lot of people have this idea that like, oh, I can't make a difference. Like I only have 200 followers or whatever, but we all belong to communities, no matter how big or small our followings are. And um, yeah, and that video ended up going completely viral. Uh, within 24 hours, it had like a million views. I think, you know, as of now, it's uh, it's at like 5.4 million. It was really wow. crazy. I did not expect that <laughs> at all. So after that happened, because one of my questions was to ask you about how you consult with brands. Is that yeah. what kind of sparked you to want to interact with brands in this different way? Like how did that come yeah. to be? Yeah. So I, so I posted that video on like a Friday and then my current business partner also posted a video that Saturday morning that also went viral. And she and I, uh, we both worked at Hearst actually at the same time. She was an editor at L.com. And so, you know, we were sister sites and worked very closely together and formed a great friendship. And so while our videos were like going viral and we had a lot of people, like a lot of influencers mm -hmm. reaching out to us being like, you know, we want to speak mm -hmm. up. We don't know what to say. We're scared, et cetera. And so Danielle and I were just kind of like talking to each other about how everyone was coming to us. And, you know, by the Monday morning, we had both like received emails from brands. And so we were both just like, why don't we like put together something to like teach people about how to navigate this. And so by the Tuesday, which was like blackout Tuesday, we actually signed our first two clients that we started doing DEI consulting with. And that was at the level of like helping them edit their apologies and doing all of that stuff. And then about 10 days later, we put together an anti-racism workshop that we started teaching to influencers. And then when the influencers took it and posted about it, then the brands got a whiff of that. And they're like, oh, wait, we want to do that too. So we also adopted the workshop for brands. Yeah. So then when you left your job and then this kind of viral moment happens, and I feel like you have this calling to kind of bring such huge value to people. Yeah. Did you feel like, and this is like part of why I'm off and kind of doing my own thing and able to like bring this type of value to brands versus like kind of being in a more corporate setting? Yeah. 
you know, at the time, I think it felt like everything was happening so fast. Yeah. I wasn't even able to make that connection of like, yeah, it was just like, everything was just happening. But I think kind of coming out of it, I was like, I just felt as though it was an affirmation that I did the right thing by leaving my job. Not that I ever really questioned it, but it was that moment of like, okay, this all makes sense. And I would not have had the space to create this and to be doing these things if I still had a full-time job. Cause I don't even know. I don't even know if I had been at my job, whether I would have felt comfortable making that video. That makes sense. So now you have, you know, the DEI consulting and you're creating content in terms of the other types of content that you are creating fashion, beauty. Is there anything specific that seems to light up your community the most where people truly come to you for something specific? Or do you feel like it's just like, or do people truly just want to know about you and your life? I always say, I think that people come to me for my style, but they stay for all the other things that I talk about. Um, yeah. You know, I'm very open about mental health. And I think when I talk about it, that really tends to get the biggest engagement, truly. Yeah. Um, and I noticed that even while I was at Bazaar, because I would say I started to be really vocal about mental health and being in therapy around like 2015. And so I could see that there was a need for people to be more open and transparent about this, even though at the time it still felt kind of scary. I had actually written an essay for Bazaar about my struggle with anxiety. And, you know, that sort of felt like a coming out of sorts where you know, I'd never spoken so publicly about it. And, but the feedback that I got really reinforced that, yeah, there's, there's a, 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 a need for this type of content. Like so many people messaged me being like, oh my God, I felt less alone after reading your story. And oh my God, I've had the same fears and I've gone through this too. So um, that's when that piece really clicked for me. So you know, it's been fun to really bring in all the different things that I'm interested in. I mean, I'm a Pisces. So are you like, we're not yes. meant, we're not meant to just do one thing. You can't box us in. We're, we're all the things. We're so Thank you. I need this pep talk. <laughs> I need this pep talk right now. Cause when I talk to my husband about all these different things that I'm like doing and pursuing, he's like, just do like one thing, like focus on one thing and do it well. And I'm like, but there's just so no, many you're not other meant things. To. You're not meant to Emily. You are not meant to focus on one thing. You are not. I'm I, I want to go in two directions because I want to talk to you more about mental health, but I'm also like, Oh, should we talk about astrology? I need to know more. Um, what made you get into astrology though? Where did that start? Because I do love everything you post about astrology. Like I, cause obviously cause we're both Pisces. So I'm on the hook. Pisces are, are just naturally drawn to this. And I will tell you, I have a 15 year old niece that's a Pisces and I never said anything to her about astrology. And by the time she was like seven, eight years old, she was already talking about it. She was buying crystal, like crystal bracelets. And then, and then I was like, okay, I'm going to nurture this and I'm going to send her books and do all the things. But it just, I don't know. It, it's just part of our nature. I love it. It's it's totally part of mine. It's funny when I when I met my husband, I did like our compatible reading, like our compatibility reading on astro.com, which by the way, was a deck like this big. Oh, he I, do it it out. I, I do it for every guy I date. But this is how I knew my husband was the one. He printed it out. He's a Virgo. And okay. he, oh, yeah. Love that. Love so that. he highlighted like everything in it. And I was like, we're polar opposites, but somehow like we're finding each other in here. He does have a Pisces moon, but regardless. Oh, <laughs> love that. Wait, what's your favorite? You. Um, I am a Pisces Gemini rising cancer moon. Oh, wow. I know. Okay. I know. Again, even with the Gemini, are you serious? Again, that is a solidifier. You are not True. meant to do the same thing. Gemini's like love information. They love talking. Like they, yes. they want to like constantly be like talking about what is going on. <laughs> 
Okay. Well, that makes me feel better. This is like a side tangent, like pep talk that I'm really appreciating. I want to go back to mental health though, because this also resonates because I'm also very open on my socials about my mental health. But was there a specific moment or event for you that made you want to share more about like your mental health? Like for me personally, it was like definitely pregnancy and postpartum where I was like, wow, this is like really a thing in an area that I'm like suffering. It is truly about health. Was there an event for you that happened or you were just like, this is something that comes up for me and I really want to share more. So it's kind of interesting. Um, the, when I wrote the essay for bizarre, it it was during an era where personal essays were becoming very popular and going Mm -hmm. viral. And so, you know, while we were in a meeting sort of brainstorming, okay, like what personal essays can we find and who can write what, you know, I just got the idea. And obviously I wouldn't have done it if I didn't feel completely, you know, comfortable with it. Um, But that's kind of where the idea was born. I was like, okay, we need personal essays. Maybe I'll write an essay about my experience with anxiety. I feel like I wrote it pretty easily, but it was definitely that day of publish. I was kind of like, Ugh, is this the right idea? Like, I just thought, oh my God, people are going to think I'm crazy. People are going to think I'm crazy. That was definitely running in my mind. Yeah. I I mean, that completely resonates. I still feel that way when I share certain things about mental health. And I'm like, I, I feel like people are going to think like, I, I'm afraid to put this out into the universe in case people are like, you're actually unwell. Like keep that to yourself. <laughs> For you, I'm assuming that you write this essay. I'm assuming that it was received well. Is that what yes. sparked you to start your newsletter, Forward Joy? And like, how do you decide who you want to bring into the fold and feature for the newsletter? So mm, I actually just made a video about this on my Instagram about how astrology actually led to the creation of my newsletter because, you know, I wrote that essay in 2015. So I think even when I was coming out of Bazaar, I never, uh, I never necessarily thought that I was going to do something so mental health focused. Like I definitely saw myself as an advocate and knew that I would continue to share that part of me, but actually like building it out into something much bigger, I just don't think really occurred to me at the time. But during lockdown, when we had absolutely nothing to do, and I'm like, I don't have a job, but I really wanted to do something that felt really purposeful. So in my downtime, I I love astrology readings. I love tarot readings and I record all of them. So I started listening to all these old recordings that I had. And in my very first birth chart reading, um, my astrologer, Rebecca Gordon, who is still my astrologer to this day, mentioned that my moon, which represents our emotions, was conjunct my midheaven, which is a point in our chart. It's kind of like the 12 o'clock dot. Mm -hmm. And that represents our career path, how the public sees us. And so because my moon is literally right on top of my midheaven, she said that meant that I was meant to put my emotions into my career and into the public. And so then I actually started thinking, okay, I'm going to start a podcast because I really love having deep conversations with people. Like that's something that makes me feel really energized. Uh, yeah. Cause I also thought like, what do, what do I enjoy doing that I would want to do even if I wasn't getting paid for it? Like I don't mm-hmm. make any money off of my newsletter. And so the podcast them turned into newsletter because I'm so not technical. So yeah, by like the fall of 2020, I started working on it and I knew that, yeah, I just, I I knew I had a lot of stories that I wanted to share about my life and how I've navigated it. I've struggled with anxiety since I was about like 11 years old and it really turned my life upside down through my like middle school and high school Uh, Mm -hmm. period. And man, the fact that I'm such a well-adjusted person (laughs) on the other end of that, it, I just never would have seen it coming. It, it really, it really rocked my world in a way that like it, it turned me into a person that I didn't even recognize. And on top of, of having a therapist, I dedicated a lot of my own personal time to 
being self-reflective and wanting to understand myself and wanting to work through all the fears that I was struggling with. And yeah, a lot of the fears that sort of like triggered my first panic attack, I eventually like worked through them and conquered them. And I think it really made me feel like such a resilient and strong person. And, you know, still to this day, I know that I can handle anything that comes my way because I'm so dedicated to like my own well-being and knowing how to navigate the really tough shit that happens. So that was really part of the impetus of like wanting to start this newsletter to like share those, those parts of me and how I feel like I, also healed myself. Yeah, I absolutely love that. And I also think just in general saying and showing how important it is to do that reflection and to do that work that you're important enough, even for myself, even still into my thirties, I have moments where I'm like, crap, I need to like do be better about this. I need to focus on this. Or like I stop going to therapy for a moment and I stop taking care of myself and things start yeah. to like slip in the cracks. And you're like, so just to have someone say like, this is important is always helpful, which leads me to talk about your podcast with Maybelline, old friends of yes. mine, which I would <laughs> yes. love to talk to you about it. Like, what is it called? What do you guys talk about it? And like, what is the theme behind it? Yeah. So I got approached by Maybelline to host their podcast called I'm Fine You. It launched in May of 2022. It's completely dedicated to destigmatizing mental health by having conversations about mental health. And I've had the you know wonderful opportunity of interviewing some incredible mental health experts as well as you know influencers and celebrities who have had their own mental health struggles. And it's just it's truly been such an honor, I think, especially as someone who worked in fashion and in magazines and it's seen as such a superficial space. And so mm -hmm. be seen as someone who can lead conversations about these really sensitive topics around mental health, like truly means the world to me and being able to do it with a brand like Maybelline, this global beauty brand who, you know, has really put their money where their mouth is in terms of like, mm -hmm. it's not just about how you look on the outside. They really do care about mental health and destigmatizing it. And, you know, I got to interview the global brand president for the first episode of the second season. And she told me about how they have a therapist that comes into their office once a week and like anyone can sign up. And I'm like, that is awesome. so incredible. And could you imagine if like every corporation operated like that? What, Truly. you know, even if it's just for someone to kind of like get a feel for what therapy is like, and then they can go out on their own. It's like, holy shit. It's just so mind blowing to me. That's awesome. I mean, I feel like a, a huge brand like Maybelline and you partnering with them, just those conversations being put out in the open is so important for mental health. And I like know Maybelline has been working on that for so long to like get that yes. content out there. So I'm so happy for them. Um, I do want to talk to you. I'm like shifting gears, but I want to go back to your style. You have an amazing sense of personal style. And I, when I see you, I feel like you exude, exude like a certain level of confidence that I really like. Have you always been a confident person? Number one. And number two, how did you identify and like narrow down your own personal style? So I would say, yes, I think I've always been pretty confident and I think that is very much nurtured by my father, who is mm. also very interested in style. Like my mom actually could not care less about clothing. Like getting her to take me to the mall as a teenager was such a struggle. Um, my dad is, my dad just loves to look good. And I also think it's part of my, both my parents are Jamaican and I also think uh, Jamaicans are very confident people. It's something that is like so hard coded into the culture. So, um, yeah, I have, I think I have always been like pretty confident and, you know, as I said earlier, like I was always interested in fashion and I, 
I think it was very easy for me to like find my sense of style. Like, you know, I'm drawn to things intuitively and emotionally. The way you say you were drawn to it, like intuitively, emotionally, I'm like, like a true Pisces. Like, that's how I describe things to my husband. I'm like, I'm just energetically like drawn to this thing. And he's like, what? Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> um, but I do feel like I have this question for you because you and I both live and like, well, you are jet setting more than I am these days, but the Westchester area. And then you are also in London. I see you all around. How does your style change when you are like living a kind of more quiet life? I'll call it in the Westchester, upper New York area. Like myself, I've had such a style like revolution slash exorcism because I like don't know how to dress anymore since I've left New York city. So I'm curious your take on that going from London, which I feel is fashion forward. And then you come here and it's like, not, not fashion forward, but it's different. Right. Yeah. It's definitely different. I mean, obviously I grew up here, so, you know, I feel like preppy style was always the style here. Like, you know, being obsessed with Ralph Lauren and, you know, the polos, the, yeah. what, the Lily Pulitzer, et cetera. <laughs> um, and yeah, I think it's so hard because I work from home most days. It's like every day I wake up and it's like, okay, what's my mood? Do I actually feel like getting dressed? Do I want to put on like jeans and a nice sweater? Um, in London, you know, the style in London is so different compared to like New York City. Um, and I live in central London, which uh, is... I don't know. I'm like, I guess like people there tend to be a bit more dressed up than they would be if mm -hmm. you were like in East London, which I would say East London is sort of equivalent to like East Village in Brooklyn. Um, so you probably will see like more sort of like cool hipstery style there. Um, but yeah, if you're walking around like central London, it's like the women are dressed up in pumps. I love that though. And trousers. Yeah. The men dress way better, way, way better. Um, but yeah, I feel like women get really dressed up. You, I feel like you rarely see women in jeans. Like, sure. You do see it not at the level of New York city where it's like jeans are the standard. I kind of love that though. I mean, at least right now while I'm sitting in my sweatpants, like my two kids are running around, I'm like, I'm going to leave you kids behind and go put on a pair of pumps and slacks and I'll see you later. <laughs> like I need to do this. I do love dressing up. Like when I Me used too. to work in an office, I dressed up every day. My style, that actually, feeling. my style actually became a bit more casual as the years went on. And I feel like that was also heavily influenced by my fashion director at the time, Carrie Pieri, who was also like my best friend at work and in life now, but she was very much a denim girl. And I, and now I feel like if you know how to style denim, like style a denim outfit, I don't know. There's something about it that feels really mm -hmm. special. Like you can obviously style it so many different ways. It can be really casual. It can be really dressed up. Uh, I feel like it requires a bit more finesse than like, oh, I'm putting on this dress, you know, or I'm putting on this skirt mm -hmm. and this blouse. So mm -hmm. as, yeah, as time went on, I literally, I, I think when I first started working at Bazaar, I probably owned like five pairs of jeans. It was so not like a thing for me. Um, and then, and now, oh my God, my denim collection is out of control. I know me too, but I, I hear <laughs> you so hard on that. Like when someone styles denim, well, there is finesse to it and craft to it. It's a good yeah. style in general. Actually. I think Alison Bornstein, I don't know if you know her. She's like, well oh, yeah, known on course. TikTok. she's yeah. amazing. And she said like, even when style looks incredibly effortless, it never is. There's craft to that. And there's effort in that. And like, that is to be like respected and there's time and energy that's put into it. Um, yeah. but I was just curious to hear about like your personal style evolution as someone who's kind of like been in different careers and bounced around kind of love that I heard your entire story. Is there any remodels that you're going through right now? Any big shifts, any big changes, something that you are adjusting to right now in your life? And that's a big kind of question. Like I'm still adjusting to having two kids. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine that's yeah. quite an adjustment. Yeah. Um, I think 
I am in the process of remodeling what my life is really going to look like for the rest of the year, especially in terms of where am I going to be located. Mm. And do you have thoughts and feelings? Like, are you leaning towards... Yeah, there is a part of me that is leaning towards spending more time in London. I'm waiting to find out what a visa situation could look like. You know, I've been born and raised in New York. So yeah. that's a big reason why I started going there because I had the freedom to and why not explore like living somewhere else. I used to cover London Fashion Week when I was at Bazaar. So I was there twice a year and yeah. I made some really good friends there. And yeah, there's... Again, there's something about it that feels like very energizing to me. So yeah. I just, yeah, I'm interested in following that feeling. Amazing. Amazing. I'm excited for you. We have to do another session where we just talk about astrology because that was very uplifting for me. I was like, I could talk about that the entire time, but I want to hear the rest of your story. Where can everybody find you? I'm at Chrissy Ford, C-H-R-I-S-S-Y-F-O-R-D on all platforms. Amazing. Thank you so much for joining us on the Remodeling Podcast, Chrissy. I loved hearing your story. Thank you so much for having me. 